And welcome to another episode of Ardent Cinema, the number one podcast for a book club style discussion of all things movies. This is a weekly podcast and we encourage you to follow along as we take a deep dive into each movie's plot, overall themes, what we thought of the acting and directing, our feelings on the film and more. At the end of each episode, we will announce the movie for next week, so make sure to listen until the end. I am your confidential host, Sean. I am your murderous host, Danny. Huh? Welcome to the show. Soy Alejandro de España. No hablo español. This week, we hope you watch along with us for L.A. Confidential 1997. They were three cops who had nothing in common. Freeze. Big B, what are you doing here? Hey, you know, man, I'm keeping the streets safe, boys. One had his own brand of justice. How's it going to look in your report? It'll look like justice. That's what the man got. I am the law. One would do anything to get ahead. Now suck my cock. And one loved the spotlight. What exactly do you do on the show, Jack? I teach Brett Chase how to walk and talk like a cop. Now, all of them are faced with solving one case. Don't move! I want confessions, Edmund. Oh, I'll break them, sir. They thought they had it all figured out. Anything bothering you about the Night Owl case? I didn't kill nobody! But what started as a murder... Became a mystery. And why was Susan Lefferts at the Night Owl? I don't know. I never heard of the Night Owl till today. That could cost them everything. How about some payback, big time? It was an information exchange. You have any proof? The proof had his throat slit. Danny DeVito. Your mother is dead. L.A. Confidential. <laughs> Available on Voodoo, Redbox, and Blu-ray. Directed by Curtis Hansen. You may know him from his work on Eight Mile and Wonder Boys. Written by Brian Hedgeland and Curtis Hansen. Starring Kevin Spacey as Jack Vincennes, Russell Crowe as Bud White, Guy Pearce as Ed Exley, James Comwell as Dudley Smith, Kim Basinger as Lynn Bracken, and finally, Danny DeVito as Sid Hudgens. Grizzly Los Angeles is protected by the watchful eye of the LAPD. But something stinks. Corruption has seeped into the veins of the city, and three unlikely heroes have got to snuff it out. Freeze! Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Let's see. My impressions. With all the intrigue of classic noir, I was held captive for the two hours and 18 minute runtime. Slowly drip-fed answers like a hungry baby with a stingy nanny. (laughs) What about you, Denny boy? Oh, wow. I can't top that. <laughs> yeah, I cannot top that. Um, well, <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, I was, yeah, I was pretty, I was very entertained, very captivated the entire time. It, uh, the movie has a runtime of about two hours and change, uh, which honestly, for, uh, for the plot, I thought it was a perfect length. Um, I was never bored. Um, it, it needed to take its time to set up all of the characters and all the intricate subplots, weave them all together. So I was very invested. Very good movie. Nice. Yeah, I can't really say it any better myself. You know, I've, I've mentioned it many times on the podcast, but any movie around two hours or more can be the death knell for my uh, concentration, my focus. But this film was so engaging and well-constructed and well-paced that I was never bored throughout and overall I thought the plot was masterful and yeah I'll get into it more later but I just think this is a wonderful film honestly dope I wanted to ask you guys if you don't mind Not at just all. to start off you know we mentioned this film is a bit more on the plot side uh, compared to some of the previous movies we watched lately which are very much character driven you know thinking to last week's episode force majeure that's completely character driven. And this is like the polar opposite <laughs> of that, really. So I'm curious to hear from you guys. Now that we've watched, you know, a number of movies, you know, we've seen movies all, all our life, but for the podcast, we've seen a number of movies at this point. Are you guys enjoying the plot dense films more? Or are you, you enjoying more the character films or character studies and more? And why? No more or less than before. It just depends on how well it's executed. They both have their place. Yeah, I agree. I can't say that I have a specific favorite. Um, I'm more used to plot-heavy films, so watching movies like Force Majeure, for example, uh, is a bit of a breath of fresh air right now. Mm-hmm. But, um, I mean, I wouldn't 
completely rule, you know, start start watching only one type. What about you? Have you developed a preference? Yeah, you know, I used to be more into like plot heavy films, but over time, especially since the start of this podcast, I found that I'm very much enjoying the character driven uh, movies a lot more than the plot focused films. With that said, I very much love this film and I think it's unique in in its regard. But overall, I'm finding that I'm I'm gravitating more towards the character studies because they they speak to more of how I view movies in general, which is kind of a um, it's like a window into investigating or contemplating um, different issues in mm. life, um, whether it's, you know, personal, mental, societal, you know, what have you. So e- even this film, you know, it's a lot has a lot to do with um like corruption in the police force and, you know, how that, you know, well, corrupts the individuals that may have had better intentions at the start of their career. But then, you know, we're influenced by the different aspects of the police force and how they operate. So for me, that's the more intriguing part of films oftentimes than, you know, following the plot point by point, beat by beat and seeing like how it's, you know, well constructed you know, well-constructed film engages me more, but that's not the thing that I typically look for in a film. I'm looking more for, like, what are the themes? What are the motifs that they're using? What is the symbolism that they're using? And how that relates to my perception of those issues and really current times and how I can view those in a lens from current times, if that makes sense. Right. So. Yeah, and also, I mean, let's not rule out the fact that this movie, despite being very plot-heavy, also has some pretty detailed character writing, um, yeah. especially the three main protagonists. Mm-hmm. Um, it was just very interesting to see um, how different, how contrast these characters were to each other in terms of the way they interact with the corruption yeah. around them. I thought of it as they're on a spectrum of, of morality. Yeah. So you have your far left, your, har- your far right, and your perfect middle. Yes, which and no yeah, one, you, you get no to see how was. they, yeah, how they push off each other. Yeah, I thought that was a very interesting part of the film, for sure. For sure. Getting into the inciting incident, we have Ed Exley, Bud White, Jack Vincennes, and the press witness the liquored up LAPD on Christmas Eve, starting a brawl with a group of Mexicans who are accused of assaulting two police officers. The Mexicans also happen to already be in lockup, which is an important point. Hey guys, they brought the Mexicans in. They're downstairs. Yeah, come on, guys, let's get him. This is for ours, Pancho. <laughs> Game stand. An investigation is levied against the department where our three heroes are asked to testify, and we get to see how all of them respond to this. Yeah, that's a good summation right. of, of, like, the... I guess, like, one of the overall themes of the film being, like... I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's interesting because... As Alejandro alluded to, we see each character react in a different way to this incident. Um, you know, some started it, some were like tangentially involved, uh, some were pulled into it, right? And it sets up very clearly in the beginning, like who these men are. Yeah. Right. Um, and, and the press started. <clears throat> none of them started. Not even Ed. He's kind of takes advantage of it, but I don't think he would have on his own gone gone and uh, started snitching on people. He was asked to, you know. You don't think you don't think he would have uh, gone out of his way because, I mean, he says pretty explicitly, like, you know, justice is what matters here, basically. You know, it doesn't yeah. matter. I think he would have at least told the head of the department. You're all going in my report. Let's go, actually. I don't think so, because he I was mean, already part of a corrupt system. Like he gets in there and immediately he's he's given some cash. He's just like, that's not my way. I think he would have just kind of plotted his own path. But I don't necessarily think he's a Serpico type character where he's going to try and bring down the whole system. Right. I mean, he was going to write a report within the police uh, department. He wasn't going to actually go out to the press. I believe it. Yeah, yeah. 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 That, that's as far as he would have gone. Yeah, no, I agree I with believe. that for sure. Speaking of Ed Exley, it's interesting because in most movies and I think in most scenarios, the kind of person who's going to be a, a whistleblower is usually suppressed and threatened. Where here he's immediately kind of thrown up the up the ladder and given opportunities because of it, which is a, I guess a very lucky break on his part. The higher up just happens to be in this position where they're trying to already snuff out these type of characters within the force. Right, and Ed, you know, just so happens to be just 
so happens to have a really good idea on how to do it. Right. The right time of, and place. I think yeah. if it was five years earlier, probably he would have had some trouble. Yeah. It kind of forces their hand, you know, into having to promote him after that. Yeah, essentially. you almost get the feeling that there's already been a lot of problems and and shake up within the force yeah. before this. He's in he's in the right spot. Um, so this scene where they're bringing in all of, you know the 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 main characters to to get interviewed, I think, was a wonderful way to kind of just show their morality gauge one by one, just so you kind of know where their headspace is at in the beginning of of the film. Yeah, there's a lot of threads in this, so doing it this way is a really good way to keep. Everything is centered. Yes, and flowing well. So at least you know what's happening with our three main guys. Right. Well, so let's let's talk about that if you don't mind. So let's let's go through each person. Sure. I think that might be helpful to get so, a sense of like who each of them actually are. So first up is uh, Bud White. Sir, I won't testify against my partner or anyone else. Played by Russell Crowe. Uh-huh. They bring him in and they ask him to testify. And, well, this one is a little more personal for Bud White because... They're asking to, uh, him to testify against his partner. Who started the brawl. Who started the brawl. Right, right. He's one of them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and immediately we see that um, Bud White refuses, just outright refuses. He doesn't want, um, he's not willing to accept any kind of bribe for it or anything like that. Yeah. I thought of him as chaotic good. Chaotic good, yeah, for he sure. Ha- he has his code, but he- and he'll do anything to achieve that code, including, what is it, strong-arming, violence, uh, straight-up murder, as long as it leads towards his Toward, idea of yes. good. Oh, but, he's, gonna... but he's completely against any kind of corruption, it seems, for the most part. I, I don't know if like, against. It, he wouldn't do it personally. But again, he was already kind of part of the system. And I think he, I, in fact, we do see him going along with his corrupt partner, like committing crimes, but he's not doing it himself. He's just along for the ride. Right. I mean, well, he feels like it's for the greater good at that point. Well, in the beginning, what's the corruption we see? They're like exploiting a, a shopkeeper out of some liquor or something. That's not for the greater good, but that's part of, that's part of being in the police mm. force at the time. Right. So are you only talking about at the beginning, not after, uh, not right after the incident? Because like... He's definitely part of some corruption, you know, when he joins uh, Captain Dudley's uh, homicide force and starts like interrogating people out of like a shady right. uh, motel later on. So, I mean, he is perpetrating some level of corruption, even if still he thinks that it's for if, the greater good. If it's seen as justice, like he's beating up bad guys. So it's fine. Yeah. We right. see later on jumping ahead a little bit. He straight up executes a guy who is mm-hmm. uh, who's a rapist. Right. So. No problem with corruption, obviously, as long as it's for punishing bad guys. So right. if he's going to sit in a room and just beat the crap out of a guy to get information out of him, no you, problem. No problem. Yeah. Zero sweat. And in the beginning, we also see that he has a very big soft spot for women in general and domestic abuse. Right. Um, which he's a product of it. Which he's a product of because, you know, later on, it's um, we find out that his father beat his mother to death right and left him there like tied to a radiator tied to a radiator and he never got any resolution so his father never, escaped right. and he never was, saw him again exactly which, which not to jump in here but which is a theme that is present through the film especially with uh ed yeah it comes where back. he talks about one of the reasons he joined the police force is because his father was uh gunned down by some criminal that um basically got away with it and you know he names the he gives the criminal name because they never really find the guy but you know one of the reasons that he's in the police force to begin with is he wants to get back at those who think they can get away with it you know right. stop and stop them for perpetuating further injustice yeah so that's right? a similarity between them two that yeah. i didn't realize <clears throat> absolutely i think all three of them have a you know certain personal trauma that leads them to becoming cops i mean even jack the uh Vince, Jack works Jack Vincennes um yeah he gets a little teary eyed when he's asked why did you join the force um which, but we don't we don't learn about his tragedy we don't backstory. learn what it is but I think there's definitely a tragedy it's to safe it safe to assume yeah yeah it's safe to assume there was a tragedy that made him join and you know he lost his way somewhere in it he lost his way to the corruption um okay so then up next is Ed Exley he comes in. Um, and he's the you know straight and by the book 
straight as an arrow mm-hmm. cop. You're busted, buddy. I'm a cat. And immediately he's like, oh, absolutely. I'll testify. No problem. Yeah. I'm here to clean up this corruption. So already you know that Here's he's... Here's your names. <laughs> yeah. Um, but then the way he goes about it, if you don't mind me jumping yeah. in here, is while he does seem very straight-laced and by the book, Alejandro had alluded to this earlier, but, you know, he is a bit of a product of the system. So he has learned over time how to operate within the system. Yeah. Not only for the benefit of serving justice and, you know, making sure that this is a corruption free precinct. But to be frank, you know, he is also a little bit on. I don't know if you'll call him selfish, but like, oh, very um, like he is doing it for his own benefit, too. Yeah, I think I called it a ladder, a ladder climber. Yes, definitely. Um, and in part, I wonder if that's because he feels like he has to operate in their way to some sense or in some sense because that's the only way to get to the top. Yeah. And at once at the top, then he can maybe start doing things the way that he thinks they should be done. I wonder how sense. intentional it was. If it was, yeah, an intentional method in order to actually get things done, like you got to play the game, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. Or if he was simply a product of his environment, that's how he thought. But anyway, regardless of which it is, that is part of his moral dilemma later on because he never turns into a bad guy. But I think he realizes that his motivations are have, have become muddy. Have become tainted, yeah, yeah. by his um, personal greed, you know, that he, he wants to be at the top so he always kind of like makes his decisions while leaning towards well what is this going to do to up my reputation and my career yeah and i think it's hard not to over actual justice right 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 and i think it's hard not to kind of sniff that this isn't real justice when he sees how quickly and how easily the success is coming Mm -hmm. like this doesn't feel right right and then he starts looking under the rug and seeing all the dirt and he starts realizing that like the real decisions he should be making are the ones that actually aren't going to give him any of that. But it's going to actually solve the crime the proper way. Right. You should versus, have some hardship doing versus that. Versus looking away. Right. Yeah. He both learns that lesson and doesn't. Because yeah. the way that he resolves the situation at the end is to basically lean into the lie that the police force wants to perpetuate so that they're not made to to seem so corrupt that they're unable to be you know reconciled you know what i mean like he he goes along with their plan basically to to perpetuate a lie Mm -hmm. so that they save face right and he tells lynn towards the end that i am you know i'm using them and they're using me i feel like that's the same kind of rhetoric that he was using in the beginning so I don't actually know if he learns much in that regard or if he grows in that regard. I think he does grow in other ways for sure. I felt like he he did grow. However, at the end, it was more of a necessary choice to be able to stay moving up the ladder in order to continue to cleanse. Well, necessary or not, I don't think that's the point. The point is that he didn't know he was going to get rewarded for doing what he did. He did it because it was the right thing. So while the result is the same, he did get rewarded and he gets another award. He very well could have been murdered by his partners or set up or something. True. He was very aware. Like they even tell him like, this is not going to go well for you. And he goes too bad. Yeah. You know? So it's more like (laughs) weird to say, but the movie or the universe rewarding him as opposed to the the force rewarding him. Exactly. Exactly. Now it's, you know, more genuine and he, he goes through these hardships for the purpose of, justice rather than his own aggrandizement you know yeah well that's a good distinction he he has to go through hardship for this right 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 and then third up we have jack vincennes mm-hmm. you know he doesn't really seem to have any kind of code of honor uh at this point in his career right because i mean at first he's like oh i'm not gonna rat out my friends because you know he knows the the negative outcome of that he knows that's gonna hurt him more yeah but once they mention, oh, okay, well, you're also, you're you're going to be off the show. Badge of Honor. Okay, the Badge the, of Honor. Here's the show. three names. Here's where they live. Yeah. Here's their badge Boom. number. Instantly, he changes his tune. Yeah. yeah, which, by the way, going back to our talk about Ed real quick, 
he was the one who suggested all that. He was the one who suggested to the higher ups that they talk to Jack because he knew he saw him there. Oh, yeah. One, two, he knew that Jack wouldn't flip or rat unless you hit him where it hurts, which is his um, uh, uh, producing credit or uh, what's the word? Technical advisor. He's the technical advisor. Like, exactly. yeah, he's the advisor to the show Badge of Honor. It's like a famous uh, cop show during the time. And that's and, really where his pride is, weirdly enough. He, he barely yeah. cares about being a cop. I mean, his nickname is Hollywood Jack. Right. So, I mean, he he very much embraces, like, this new technology. He very much embraces this new way of thinking of, like, celebrity. Right? You know, one of the first uh, perps that he catches is, like, a, an actor, right, with some weed, basically. And he makes sure to work with Sid to get a picture in front of the Hollywood sign. Or, like, well, like a Hollywood sign in the city you know because like he he likes a celebrity right so ed you know i think he's perceptive enough to see this and he knows that hit him there that that's where you'll get him right so all, all of that interview was a function of ed's uh scheming so to speak to move up the ladder yeah ed's a very good manipulator and i felt like it was a byproduct of him having to do things by the books he actually needs to know how to work people and get answers out of them or he's the outlier. Pretty much the whole force throughout the throughout the movie, we see the way you get they get answers is they beat it out of you, or they shoot yep. you, <laughs> or they threaten to shoot you. They're not going to yeah. get answers if they shoot you. But well, yeah, some of those cops came in and they were ready to like just gun everybody down like immediately. I was talking about in terms of interrogations. Oh sure. Yeah, yeah. Ed actually has to learn how to hone that skill. Right. And he uses it to uh, to great effect, even against his fellow officers, because everybody else is kind of a dullard at that point. Yeah. And he does it quite expertly. Um, I love how the scene is written when he's interrogating the uh, the three um, rapists. Yes, the yeah. rapists <laughs> who they he believes uh, that they were the, the the people who you know did the mass shooting in the diner, the night owl diner, in the yeah. night owl diner, right? And uh, it's interesting how he manipulates each of them. He kind of he mic you know the rooms are mic'd up so you can. You can that with intercoms, and you can hear from the other interrogation room what yeah. is being said. And he chooses very carefully when to turn it on and off, just so that the other associate will hear what this guy's talking about. Yeah. So to make it clear, they're all in separate rooms, and yes. he's piping in audio specifically to get them to turn on each other. Yes, yeah, yeah. exactly. Still. Yeah, it's really, really well done. Which is interesting. Do you think? He's always had that in him, or do you think that's something that was spurred on by this event that, you know, he noticed that it was like sink or swim basically at this point, like either his career was going to progress at this point or was going to go nowhere? Oh, I think he's been good for a long time. That's something he's honed with practice and doing things by the books. Do you think he's done a lot of interrog interrogations? Because he was like the, the, the commander on watch. I don't know how much they, they I, do like interrogations I don't and detective think he, work. I don't think he had much field experience, but this seemed like the guy, the type of guy that has done a lot of reading on theory and how to, you know, get this done. And he's been manipulating for quite a while just to get by. Yeah, so maybe he hasn't had the chance to show it off in the field, but it's it's definitely practice, not Yeah. I mean, maybe he has a natural inclination, but it's not his first rodeo. Right. I mean, to Danny's point. Uh, the captain does quickly mention that he had like top marks on the the they detective did test, that. the lieutenant test. So yeah. you know he is, I guess, very practiced, as Alejandro said. Like maybe he hasn't had a lot of field experience, but he this is like his life. He yeah. lives and breathes this. Yeah, I mean he's highly motivated due to the death of his father. So that's right. just been his his goal since then. Right. So now that we talked about the characters, I do want to. We don't normally give a spoiler warning, but I want to mention that because this is a very plot important story, it's kind of like giving the end to seven, you know, what's in the box, mm -hmm. that if this sounds interesting, you may want to just watch it from here and then come back. Um, that said, there is so much detail in here that if you don't really care about ending spoilers, there's still going to be a lot you learn from the movie. Just putting that out there. So with that being said, let's talk a little bit about Dudley Smith. Who? Captain Dudley Captain Smith. Captain Dudley Smith. Dudley Smith. He is Boyle. an SOB. Definitely an SOB. And he's the, you know, he's the main antagonist of this entire film. We already see early on when he's talking, where he's talking with Ed Exley, and he's pretty much telling him, 
are you prepared to do what's necessary to become a detective? And by what's necessary, he mean he 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 gets very specific. He's like, are you willing to plant evidence on a suspect that you know to be guilty? Mm-hmm. Um, are you willing to like well, beat a confession? Beat yeah. a confession out of out of a guilty party? Um, things like that. Things that are very questionable that should not be done. In the police force, there, and there's one he mentions. Sorry to interrupt you. There's one he mentions. Are you willing to shoot a man in the back that you know to be guilty? That says no at the time, but that comes around back to him yeah. later on hey. towards the end. That is very true. Yeah, at first he says no, but spoiler alert, he shoots him in the back. <laughs> well, here's another reason Dudley is asking these questions. It's not just to warn him about what he's gonna need in the forest. But he's actually figuring out who he can recruit as one of his soldiers. We come to find out he is building an underground criminal empire and pretty much using the police force as his soldiers. Mm-hmm. Yep. So he's gauging this new recruit and saying, well, how, how can I work this guy? Which yeah. was really cool when you find out. Yeah, it's interesting. This is the second time that I've seen this film. And the first time that that kind of that point like flew over my head um, when I was watching it, I hadn't realized that like. Basically, the the majority of of uh, Dudley's conversations with people is to kind of gauge where their loyalties lie, right? You know, beyond just the the regular like, okay, here's the rundown of the situation. You know, every personal conversation he's had with somebody is basically, well, who can I trust here? And he's very quick to suss out when somebody is shifting all- all- allegiances. His he's mm-hmm. very trained at that skill. Oh yeah. So he has a very keen eye for that, and uh, you see it when Bud White decides not to stay for the whole interrogation. Like, they're interrogating this guy and, like, beating him, Mm -hmm. and you see him drive off to go see Lynn, and then you get one shot of this guy just looking out the window, kind of like, hmm. He's already planning Bud's downfall. exactly. (laughs) He's like, "I, I don't think you're the same anymore. Yeah, for somebody to be in that position of power, I mean, he's got to be a little bit paranoid. For sure, you know, especially oh, running yeah. the racket that he's been running for so long. Yeah, that's the downside of people in that position. They have to constantly look over their shoulders, and he's very trained at it. He's been doing it for a long time. Mm-hmm. Um, in fact, some of the old timers who have already retired were working with him in the past, doing hits. Like this has been his his whole career. It's explained in the film that he is taking over for a former gangster's. Uh, racket. That's I mean, right. There's a vacuum in power. <clears throat> right. Yeah. You had alluded to it earlier, but just to be clear, I think it's Mickey Cohen that he's taking over for. Okay. Yeah. Right. Um, he's just mentioned by name, right? We never see him. No, we do see him in the very beginning, like uh, during, during, the, during Sid's the... like uh, uh, promo, basically for LA. Uh, he does explain like right, the right. the the power centers in Los Angeles, and you do see a quick shot of Mickey Cohen there and his uh, bodyguards and all that. Mickey sees the head of organized crime in these parts. He runs dope, rackets, and prostitution. And the dapper little gent does it in style. It's a black eye for the image of Los Angeles. Because how can organized crime exist in the city with the best police force in the world? I don't know if this was explicitly said, but was the captain the reason that Mickey Cohen went down? Or was that just a... Or was his like intrusion into that field or into that empire just a result of the police force doing their job, you know, stamping out corruption? And then he saw like a power vacuum, I think you mentioned, and he decided to take it over. Like, what, what do you guys think? I think a mix, but mostly the latter. But I'm sure as he was orchestrating this takedown for tax evasion, I believe it is, he's fully aware of what his next plan, his next step is already. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it's never really expl- explicitly said whether or not he was the one that took down Mickey. Yeah, but we know he's been corrupt for a long time, so you gotta yeah. you got to imagine he has his eye on things. Absolutely. I got a question for you guys. How did the bunch of rapists escape the jailhouse? That so is gonna, a, that's a very good question. So we're going to talk about incongruities in the film? No, no, no. This no, isn't definitely incongruity. not. Or not, sorry, not incongruity. Uh, strange happenstances that happened before. Well, that, that, that's one possibility. Yeah. But... Now, this is a little convoluted, but I thought this this is the order of events, and it's hard to imagine he planned it, but it very much could have been. Dudley orchestrating their escape in order to force a shootout in which they'd be killed 
in order to expeditiously close the Night Owl case. Because the Night Owl case, which we talked about earlier, is this five or six person murder spree where Dudley was killing former partners of his because they had stolen heroin. So this kind of all loops in together. Was he trying to kind of beautifully close up the circle by letting these guys escape intentionally? Oh, absolutely. We, I mean, we know he was already trying to close it up before they were caught, before the three black criminals were caught. Um, yeah, I because, mean, this is, this is Joker level of planning, though. So. Yeah, <laughs> but no, but Dudley Smith, I mean, we know that he hires or he, he gets his two cop goons yes. to go earlier to the to the house where the three black men are mm -hmm. and plant the shotguns in the car. Oh, I missed that. And then yeah, that go upstairs seen, yeah. and kill them. That was that was supposed to be the job, but guess what? Um Jack, Jack Vincent Jack pops the gun up yeah. and Ed Exley get there and they decide to do it together and then they couldn't get they okay, couldn't that do, makes it more likely they though. couldn't do the killing. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Okay, okay. So he let them go again so to have another opportunity to kill them. So I got it right, but I had missed what made it more likely. Yeah. And not only that, but I think Dudley sees this as an opportunity to not only surreptitiously uh, close this case, but also make a hero out of somebody in the case, right? Like, I think he does a masterful job of um, reacting right. to the situation because he sees that, like, hey, if someone comes in there and like solves this case and you know just happens to kill them, they're gonna be made a hero. I, I get the sense that Dudley was trying to groom um, Ed for some time to be kind of almost like his second hand, or at least get rid of his fire a little bit, which kind of happens when you when you put him within the system. You know, that's true. Now he's that's established. True, yeah. yeah, for sure, for sure. So he's very um, manipulative and masterful in yeah. that regard. Um, but yeah, going back to the how they could have escaped, um, I would imagine, yeah, Dudley probably pulled something to be able to allow them to escape, right? I mean, they yeah, mentioned probably, that they, they escaped through the window somehow. That was what some of the officers said, but they probably just unlocked their they gates. Just, yeah, they let them go. Yeah. yeah. When, when Ed and this random cop, he gets like another cop as backup, and he says, come with me, and he goes to where the three guys are hiding out after they escape... And you kind of see like a shock in their face when they see the cops. Almost like, I thought you let me go. Almost oh, mm. I didn't like know, what's I didn't even like think what's of that, yeah. like what's going on here? And they're like in shock. And I didn't catch that. It seemed like they were almost trying to talk to them. But what sets off the the shooting is actually well, the excuse. <laughs> oh well, maybe the yeah the partner. Yeah, the, yeah. the partner. Because it wasn't starts... one of our heroes who started shooting. It was exactly, one of the other guys. it was the other guy. The so, other guy that was there that was playing the shotgun, actually. Oh, there we go. Right. Yeah. So he sees that drop, like one of them drops a pot by accident, and yeah. that's the excuse he needs. Boom, he starts shooting, and then that's it. They are all they all get gunned down. Yeah, where the sole survivor is Ed. Mm-hmm. Which, by the way, that was both a cool and gnarly scene of how he catches the last guy in the elevator. Oh, he runs yeah. towards the elevator, sticks his barrel in to like stop it, and you think, oh, that's the end of it. But no, he fires. Then we just see the door open and we just see Ed's like horrified face of what he just did. Because like, had he killed before? Had he killed anybody before? I get the sense that he didn't. Like, this is the first time that he feel like he didn't. Yeah. That he had to actually like shoot somebody. So to go from potentially not shooting anybody to two shotgunning three. like three people, two <laughs> or three people, it's pretty hardcore. The look on his face when he shoots the guy in the elevator, because it was a blind f a shot, by the way. Yeah. I thought there was going to be like a kid there that he blasted. Oh, oh God. Oh you see him goodness. just staring at it for 10 seconds. I'm like, oh, my God, he just shot a kid. Yeah. Ugh. Oh, that would have been horrible. <laughs> yeah. It's that was risky. Very. Mm -hmm. I wanted uh, a little side note that I wanted to mention about uh, Dudley Smith, mm -hmm. uh, specifically his accent. Did oh. you guys... Did you guys have any problem with that? I mean... I generally don't notice accents. What, what, what did you hear? I think he's supposed to be Irish. Yeah, he says boyo. He says boyo, and then he said he, he, meant, he, he mentioned something oh. about Irish whiskey at one point, and okay. he says lad, laddie, and, mm -hmm. but I thought his accent was pretty bad. Really? I thought it... Yeah, again, I'm not good with accents, but it was at least consistent all the way through. I, I thought it was uh, effective enough for me. Isn't James Cromwell like a British actor? I could be mistaken, but... Maybe that's why, because he's not actually Irish. I'm, I'm not sure, but I don't know. It sounded like almost mostly American with like a light hint of. 
I want to say like he is American, Isaac. right? He, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm not Most sure of his either. movies, he plays an American at least. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I, but you I get what, what you're saying. Like, it sounds like a bit of an affect that he puts yeah. on, like, at certain moments. I personally sound more consistent. Yeah, I yeah. personally didn't mm. like it. Um, it, it. Yeah, I can't really say whether it, it's good or not, but it bothered me. No, right. Uh, I'd like to mention one last Dudley Joker plan. Okay. <laughs> one of his long strings of, of uh, scheming. Pierce Patchett who is like this Hugh Hefner type cat. He gets his call girl slash buddy's girlfriend, uh, Lynn is I think her name, to sleep with Ed Exley so that thanks to Pierce's tip off, Sid, the paparazzi guy, who's played by... Um, Danny DeVito. Danny DeVito, exactly, will catch them and take pictures. Now, this is done so that Sid can be forced to leak the pictures with Bud in attendance. You with me so far? Mm-hmm. Uh, why is Bud in attendance? In attendance, because he works for Dudley, who's secretly working with Pierce, <laughs> and Dudley does all this so that Bud will kill Ed, which will end the investigation into the Night Owl killings, which again he perp- he perpetrated, which almost works. Bud almost runs into the precinct and just straight up beats Ed to death because of these leaked pictures. So he sets up like a chain of five or six events, again, to try and close all the loopholes and create a perfect circle. The guy is a mastermind. This is multiple times <laughs> he does this. Yeah. Yeah. Talk he about, was born I mean, for this. Yeah. Talk, this story, I have to say, I mean, the overarching story isn't, I wouldn't say it's convoluted. Like it's fairly, I guess, easy to follow, but like it's details. It's the details. But once you know the beats, you realize it's actually a pretty, like the overall yeah. story is pretty straightforward. Yeah, it is straightforward, but yeah, it's like super detailed. You really have to pay attention. You might have to even see this movie a, a couple times. It's like the difference between reading a headline or an article and then going through the court proceedings and realizing all the details involved. Exactly. In, yeah, it's a right. full picture. Mm-hmm. But I feel like it's e- this movie is equally attractive to people that want to read through all of it you know that want to see all these details yeah. well that's your multiple viewings right you right exactly and someone just seeing at the first time and just watching these beats and really mm-hmm. so maybe not even getting everything that happened but it's still enjoyable without it yeah you know what i mean because well, because the revelations are clear enough even to somebody who isn't super detail oriented the movie will spoon feed it to you by the end so you at mm-hmm. least understand the the total picture yeah so I mean, like yeah you're not going to get confused at the end yeah i mean like Ed literally lays it out. He lays it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like at the very yeah. End. It's it's just interesting how they wrote it so that it is accessible from different viewpoints. Yeah, and to di- to different uh, types of viewers. Exactly. For sure. Yeah. Going back to his plan real quick, the reason that that plan can mostly work so well is because he just knows everyone in his force right. so well. I mean, it. He's a good listener, which I always appreciate in characters even if it's for terrible reasons, but still he has a good understanding of people and how they tick. You know, the reason why he sets all that up with Bud is because Bud is presented as an angry man, like a very, very angry man, a very aggressive person. Yeah. I mean, he, who he's worked with for a while. So he's, who he's fully with. aware of it. Exactly. But he understands that like most things will set him off. And he even says so himself, like throughout the film about Bud, that, you know, any little thing will set him <laughs> off. So, like, steer clear of the guy. Right. Right. It's best to stay away from the man when his blood is up. His blood's always up. But perhaps you should stay away from him altogether. So he knows that this, like, ultimate betrayal by Lynn, you know, sleeping with Ed, will set him off and force him to basically do his job and, like, just close this loop, as as you said. Shut down that investigation. Mm-hmm. And Definitely, he knows Ed in is, a way, and is very comfortable with murder, no problem. Yeah, and it's done in a way that it's not tied to him whatsoever. Exactly. Because he was just there, uh, you know, doing his job, and this is a byproduct of that, and he can't control his officers at this point. And he ties up the loose end with Danny DeVito's character after, right after that he murders Oh, yeah, him. that I mentioned that he, he kills all the guys he's been working with, the Hugh Hefner-type yep. dude, Danny DeVito. Everyone. Yeah. So the reason... It's so convoluted. It's not to be convoluted. It's so that nothing can be traced back to him. He's playing everybody against each other. So that's why you have to have all these moving pieces. And and obviously yeah, Bud Bud would never would never say why he did it in the first place, even if he was interrogated, because he was committing a crime mm-hmm. when he found out this information. Very true. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, it's very clear that uh, uh, this the captain has zero 
um, loyalty. Empathy. <laughs> and empathy and loyalty yeah. to anyone but yeah. himself oh, yeah. essentially. oh the ultimate ladder climber for Oof. sure yeah yeah like he's what ed could be right if he didn't have his moral center that's a funny parallel hey maybe dudley started that way and got corrupted along the way maybe maybe <laughs> maybe i mean you know ed and uh bud are very similar uh but ed and uh dudley ed and are yes i was thinking the ed, same thing ed and dudley are very similar you know, we haven't talked about Jack too much. Like, he he's interesting because he's kind of the yeah. character that is like almost too far gone at this point. Yeah, I would say the least sympathetic in the beginning. Yeah, definitely the least sympathetic. But I mean, he, he I feel like he's just too far gone and he's trying to find some kind of redemption almost like even if he doesn't realize it. Right. Like he's trying to get back into some kind of moral center mm-hmm. or trying to obtain this moral center. Even though it's going to be too difficult for him. I mean, Dudley even mentions to him, like, you don't even know what good looks like anymore. Something to that effect. Right. Well, right. that's what makes him the most tragic in my eyes. Because he Definitely. has the furthest to go and he's making that leap. Whereas yeah. everybody else is kind of making a course adjustment. He's leaping into the dark. Like, this is completely alien, um, an alien place to him. and he, and he he's And he's doing it. And then, of course, he's the one who gets... Who gets shot for no other reason than he he figures it out faster than anybody else does. He finds the connections. So to be clear, uh, Jack starts to figure out that maybe Dudley is involved in this in some way, or at least some of like ex cops are involved in this like racket. Yeah, he doesn't know Dudley's place in it, but he sees that he's he's um what's the word? He's got connections with all these people who were corrupt, and he's trying. He's just asking him like, why? What happened here? What were you doing in this situation? I mean, he seems like the kind of guy that could put two to two together and like knows that maybe there's something off with this guy. Like the moment he notices that Dudley was like the the uh, officer in charge of yeah. the other two cops. I mean, I think he pretty much knew that this guy was involved in some way. You think so? Because the way he asks it is very sincere. Well, because I think he knows he doesn't want to like ruffle any feathers mm. and doesn't want to like out himself necessarily. But Dudley's, you know, unfortunately a bit too smart for that. Um, so I get the sense he was putting on a bit of an act there rather than being like at super genuine there. Could be, could be. Perhaps. Um, but yeah, I do really like that detail that right before he dies, he says the name of the made up. Well, the, the, the name that uh, Ed gives him. Ed gives him for the made up name. Oh, of of his, of his father's, father's killer, killer. Yeah. yeah, you know, because they they never discover the guy's name, so he had to make a name for himself just to give this guy a name, essentially. Yeah, he gives it to him. give himself like a, a target. Exactly, you know? give himself a target, so he remembers that, and he knows that Dudley's going to investigate that name. So right before his death, he says it. He says, "Rolo Tomasi," is the name, and then you see in a later scene, you see Dudley go to Ed, and he's like, "Hey, have you heard of?" Rolo Tomasi. You ever heard Vincennes mention him? No, no, I haven't. Well, probably nothing. Still, keep your eyes open, eh, Boyle? You know, immediately sets that off. Yeah, and Ed just like, yeah, you see his face in shock. Like, he, he automatically he knows, okay, this guy's oh, corrupt. Oh, I didn't realize that's why he did it. Nice. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. So, Ed did a great job there, by the way, of keeping a straight face. Again, like he's built in this system or he's been built up in this system. So he knows not to show any weakness Mm -hmm. there um, for the most part. And, you know, that's what sets him off into investigating Dudley and, you know, the rest of the force, which speaking on that real quick, you know, he normally doesn't show that much weakness except for Lynn sleeping with her. But then also his glasses, which is just like a side thing. But everyone keeps mentioning lose the glasses. And then eventually he just just starts forgetting these glasses like all the time so it's like they're pointing out a particular weakness of his but it's not the weakness that really matters at the end it's just like a a um superficial weakness that they're pointing out in him but you know they they don't see this man for who he really is and he he's ultimately the one that takes them all down mm-hmm. basically so the movie ends with an awesome big shootout dudley sets a trap for ed and bud I think I want to say it's six cops versus the two of them. Does that sound right? I didn't count it. I'm not sure. Could be around six. Yeah, around six. So pretty meager odds, and they managed to just squeak out survival. 
Dudley gets shot in the back, like Sean had mentioned before. And then we we see Bud. He goes to live happily ever after with Lynn, which I thought was pretty fitting because police, police work, to me, seemed like a default option for him as opposed to something he was passionate about. And he wasn't the type of person who was ever going to climb to the top. So I felt I felt that worked, him yeah. going off, quitting the police, being happy with Lynn. Yeah, I agree. I agree. For sure. Yeah, and going back to that, the reasons why Ed was doing what he was doing. Yeah. Um, you know, the the real turning point for him was when he decided to, well. Make when, an enemy of Dudley. Well, there's that, yeah. And also the fact that he was known for being the hero of the Night Owl case. Right. You know? And I feel like the old Ed might let that go for his own, per- you know, because he. Cause, well, which is why Dudley put him in that position. Exactly. now you have so much to lose. Right. But yeah. then that the turning point was him just willing to say, you know what, I was wrong about this case. I'm willing to shut it all down. I'm really, I'm willing to risk my reputation, mm-hmm. and, life. and my life, and my job, and everything, um, in order to really get this right and actually serve justice. Right, which is what I mean before when I said he just, he basically just has to course correct and continue doing what he was doing at the beginning. He's yeah. always on the ball. Right, right. The ending's very interesting because they both get what they want. Mm-hmm. Bud just wants a quiet life. And, you know, as Lynn mentions, uh, basically like a, a washed up hooker and a trip to Arizona. While Ed gets basically what he wants, which is like more power in this police force. Right. I mean, is that fair to say? A harsh word, but sure, fair. Um, yeah, I, I guess to me, he's not as altruistic as maybe the film is making him out to be. But isn't that his course correction that now he is, whereas before he wasn't so much about the altruism? It, it's tough to say because I keep going back to that line of like I'm using them and he's using they're using me, right? Like if you were, I feel like if you're that's truly him, altruistic, that's him accepting the reality of it and not so much mm-hmm. about his um his reasoning to, to do it in the first place, right? But I, I would think true altruism, you know, is despite any kind of like sense of reality right like you're gonna do the thing that's best for everyone in the greatest good possible that doesn't allow for any kind of like corrupting aspects to be you know involved if that makes sense like it's not you know that's why we don't often see like real true altruism in society in general because there's always some level of personal motivation exactly well i'd say taking on dudley was the example of that but i mean fair enough he doesn't end up being an angel but yeah. definitely improved from where he started Yeah, he was willing to to lose everything on in that fight with dudley and then when he happened to find an opportunity later to still gain uh, a level of recognition he still took it because i think ultimately he still is yeah. Uh, he still has a part of, you know, that's a part of him. He's still like a selfish guy. So I'd mm-hmm. say fair enough. Yeah, he doesn't end up being a perfect angel. But Definitely not. it's not bringing anyone else down at that point. So I didn't see too much wrong with it. And the, you know, the police commissioners or all these, all those people sure. are, were already going to make certain decisions. You know, there was not much he can do at that point other mm-hmm. than, oh, well, let me put myself up here too, give myself more power. We we'll just have to hope he fights it from the inside. Exactly, point. exactly. You know that that's like my wishful thinking on that. Well, I'm not sure. I'm not so sure it doesn't hurt people because it's building a perception of the police force based on a lie, on a, like a massive lie, right? So now you have to perpetuate that lie, well, in perpetuity. Well, yeah, right? that's 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 a big conversation. That's like the story of Watchmen: is the greater good worth worth it if it's based on a lie? Well, right. let's well let's ask this question: What would he do as an alternative at that point? I don't know that he would do any alternative because this to him is like the best path forward to doing the best, to doing the most good. But again, as we've mentioned many times, he is a product of this system, so he doesn't know how to act outside of the system wholly. You know what I mean? Like it's See, not it's, like it's not like he goes through the press. It's not like he calls upon any like external um uh authorities yeah to like handle this situation he's handling in the way that he knows how which is within the bounds of the system yes yeah, so you're saying if he, he flipped he would just like scorch earth call out everybody who's corrupt and get it out there yeah like if if he really was the person that i think the film 
in some parts wants him to be or shows him to be like yeah he would just move beyond the bounds of this of the city and like just take every single person down in it and rebuild the the structure of this police force maybe somewhat selfishly in his own image right of, but he wouldn't be goodness. able to that's the, that's the point he would have to ruin right. his career yeah right. they, exactly if he went the other way it would ruin his career because i mean let's be real he 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 was found with a pile of dead cops around him but, you know, I, but it, I see sean's point that if he completely did make that mental flip then that's what he would do but i'm, I'm happy enough with improvement yeah oh yeah me too me too i like, think it's still the smarter move still the smarter it's just move, the smarter sure. move to yeah. protect yourself and to still do good you know so i thought yeah we'll yeah let, we'll let him have it yeah yeah for sure i mean like true altruism is not always the smartest move you end up being like a rorschach and and watchman there you go or like mm-hmm. that that's where that leads you right you know so all right so let's switch gears for a moment and talk a little bit about the overall tone of this movie um this you know it calls itself a noir film Mm -hmm. definitely i personally see it as a bit of a soft noir uh in terms in terms of it no i'm talking cinematography wise story wise it's it's hard edged you know It, it is exactly as it states but in terms of its lighting and cinematography i feel like um they went a little bit more with a bit more of natural lighting. It has its moments of high contrast, like a traditional uh, noir film. But it, I feel like they kind of used a bit of a contemporary style as well. Definitely. Oh, 100%. It, it's rare to see it go full noir because then it's just too on the nose and you lose your general audience. Like we've seen a few who do yeah. that and you just don't gain the same audience. Yeah, I feel like this movie struck a really good balance there yeah of it remaining having its noir elements but also um it being a sort of colorful film at certain moments yeah shot a lot in daytime you know that that to be clear because a lot of noir is shot at night or set in night scenes you know a lot of grungy areas a lot of like back alleys i mean like they're often like out in the streets walking around you know, beautiful vistas around. Yeah, I would call. Cl- I would say classic noirs are actually a lot of white collar criminals. It's your lawyer killing his wife for the insurance money. So I, I wouldn't say it's very much grungy or back alley. But uh, but yeah, in, in that sense, it's 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 not too stylistically different. Well, like I, I I guess what I mean there is like I picture they're in an alleyway and there's like a, a manhole there and there's like steam coming off the manhole. That doesn't strike and- me as classic noir. I, I've seen a few and I've seen that, but Black I mean, and white? Maybe, maybe, yeah, yeah, mm. I can't think of any examples. Hey, it depends so. on your reference point. Yeah, the yeah. ones I've seen are more white color. Um, I also want to add that um, I guess what makes this a little different from typical noir movies I've seen is that this film actually used 45 different locations in its film. So it's quite grand. Sounds expensive. And expensive. <laughs> um, the film, this is, a, this is also a little did you know. Did uh, you know? The film has... 80 speaking parts. I believe it. <laughs> Tons keep, of characters. A lot of characters. They keep introducing a character after character after character. <laughs> First and last name every yeah. single time. Hello, Leland Meeks. <laughs> Hello, uh, Dudley Smith. Hello, Roger Hemingway. Hello, Bud White. Like, Bud White, I think, was like the most used name in this whole film. Everyone kept referring to him not as Bud, Bud White. Bud White, yeah. No, it got pretty confusing after a while. I had to kind of refer to like a cheat sheet <laughs> to be able to remember who these people were. Yeah. Right. One more thing I wanted to note about the tone is there's a, at least from the movies that I've seen of this type, um, there was a bit more like moments of levity than in the typical noir films that I've, I've seen in the past, um, which I very much appreciated. It's not like all intense. It's not all intensity all the time. But sometimes I, I can't think of any movies off the top of my head, but sometimes there are movies that are of a classic type and try to introduce like modern elements that don't always work to its benefit. Um, you know, I think to a lot of like more contemporary Shakespeare films that try to in- include uh, stylistic choices 
of the times now yeah. into the film to try to you know uh, distance themselves from like previous iterations of the film. Sometimes the doesn't always don't blend, and yeah. it doesn't always work. And they uh, they don't do it subtly enough sometimes. And, oh yeah, and it feels too. really jarring. Like this was a very it was subtle a subtle blending of these two, mm -hmm. you know, that made it just feel unique enough. Yeah, um, good point. So I got a question for you guys. How much do you think was the budget for this over two-hour film with over 80 speaking parts, multiple A-listers, and 45 different locations? Why don't you go first, Alejandro? I'm going to say 50 million. Okay, 50. Sean? Well, Movie Avatar 2 came out not that long ago at the time of recording. Wow. And that was like around 200, 250 million dollars. So I'm going to say about 200 million dollars. <laughs> oh, wow. A lot of CGI actors in this, huh? Well, I mean, let's be clear. Most of the set, <laughs> most of the locations were CGI. They're just walking around mm. in front of a uh, big studio area and they kind of just peppered in like certain buildings here and there. Ah, uh, okay. Wow. CGI. I mean, hey, some films done that. I think Die Hard, you, you mentioned that the. The city itself was, was like all set. Was all CGI. CGI. It was CGI set. set. <laughs> oh my god! <laughs> well, right, okay. Number. Well, I know for a fact they use zero CGI for this. As a matter of fact, since it's supposed to be set in a 1950s Los Angeles, mm -hmm. back in the 1950s, none of the buildings were taller than City Hall. Um, so, in order to keep with the time of the movie they had they actually never raised the camera at a high angle to see how high the buildings really were oh that's interesting i hadn't thought about that yeah now that i think about it all the shots were like at level or a little below exactly level or a little below like i eye, eye level otherwise they'd have to you know try and use cgi or something to cut out the buildings they could have done it so what's the number so the number is 35 million was close. Alejandro wow. was a little closer than you. <laughs> just, you slowly. said what, 55? 50. 50. Okay. That, I mean, that's, that's, well, I mean, that's, that's a lot done on that budget, honestly. Yeah, it's pretty impressive. Do you know what it grossed? Did you write that down? I didn't, but I just Googled it. The box office number is 126 million. Making its money back. So not bad. Damn, did well, yeah. It made it uh, fourfold. As a matter of fact, uh, Russell Crowe has stated that he wished they made a sequel bad because he because he wants because he loves playing that character i can imagine that would look like yeah, such a he fun really character. liked it he was actually really worried about playing this character he didn't think he could do it he, I mean, he, he pulled it off I, he was my favorite character like just to watch yeah yeah he was really entertaining and man some of those scenes like when he like breaks the chair with his hands when we he didn't gets even so mention at one point he goes hulk mode <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah was there, there were some liberties done with the film where he's breaking like just Full wood chairs, just in half. No liberties with needed. like, with like just the pure force of rage. Crow, right? Yeah, no, no, no. he's Bud White, baby. He fights his directors and he fights his fans. It's a problem no one understands. If there's two things he loves, it's fighting and fighting around the world. Russell Crowe. Yeah, man. You know, talking about him wanting a sequel, they did in 2003 shoot a pilot for an LA Confidential TV show. But uh, it never got picked up, Woo. unfortunately. Which I no, I don't know about that because they're. I think well, maybe not in two thousand three. I think if they had, it was like five, six years later. You know, during the golden age of TV as it started to come about, I think that could have been good. Um, mm, maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Even during the golden age, I feel like we just remember the hits, and I think it was still mostly garbage. And I want to go back to uh, what we were saying about Bud White. Yeah, you know. Um, you know, and his strength in the movie. Actually, his character is supposed to be, uh, he was supposed to be the biggest cop in the precinct. Like, he was written as that character. Mm. Um, but because... But his presence is enough. Like, he has a, a large presence. Exactly. But there's a reason Why? for that, actually. Um, so, noting that uh, Russell Crowe wasn't even six foot tall, um, he apparently decided to move into a small apartment an apartment so small that he had to duck to get into the doorways and he can barely stand up. Crow said this worked in making him feel like a giant by the time he came to the set. That is very interesting. He came across to me like somebody who's five, six, just the way he walked. 
like he was just trying to inflate himself all the time. He had that look about him, like a like a like a small man syndrome. Even though he's a obviously a, a normal guy, which kind of matches because he is a he is a smaller dude, <laughs> but he was living in this tiny apartment to give himself the feeling like he's big. That's funny, yeah, and that's gonna give you that false. Maybe I guess, it works. Sense. Yeah, we ready for scores, boys? I'm ready. Sure, let's do it. All right, my score <laughs> <laughs> is eight point five out of ten. Fantastic modern noir with an all-star cast, brilliant performances, and a captivating mystery. If that all sounds good to you, I highly recommend it. What about you, Danny boy? I give it a 9 out of 10. Woo! It was nice. a beautifully made noir film with amazing cinematography, amazing characters, location, story. Everything was just spectacular. Very cool. Hit us, Sean. I also give it a 9 out of 10. I love this film. It's such a great noir detective mystery, but for contemporary times. The acting, directing, and filmmaking of the film are outstanding. Um, it's a very plot-heavy film with lots of characters coming in and out of the film. But we still get meaningful character moments to have a good understanding of each character and their shifting motivations. So with that, you know, I found it to be such an excellent film. Um, so yeah, 9 out of 10. All right, and with that, join us next week for Mulholland Drive 2001. We once again return to the beautiful city of Los Angeles where a woman suffers from an identity crisis after a car crash leaves her with amnesia. Can she and her newly found friend discover the mystery of her true identity? Watch and find out. Sean, where can they find us? You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at Art and Cinema. And if you're listening to this on your favorite podcast app, please give us a rating and a review. It goes a long way towards building uh, the podcast. And if you're listening to us on YouTube, hit that like button, click subscribe, and hit that little notify bell so you're made aware when new episodes drop every week. And with that, everybody, thank you very much for listening. I'm getting weird looks from my co-host at the moment. Because it looks like you're going to prepare to do something right now. I'm preparing to do nothing but end this beautiful podcast uh -huh. with two of my favorite people. All right, let's hear it. And with that, we bid you adieu. Happy New Year and long live the new flesh. Bang, bang. Rolo Tomasi. Tomasi. <laughs>